up until now, what we've done is we've created a fungible token that has unique features like being able to claw back and freeze and keep track of circulating supply. And we've done all of that without smart contracts. But most of this bootcamp, what we're going to be focusing on is smart contracts. So I want to go a little bit about how smart contracts work on Algorand and how they look like to manually deploy them. Now, earlier I said you don't need to follow along. This is especially true now. A lot of this code is manual code that is going to be solved for us by Beaker, making our lives way easier. But I thought it was important as we introduce the core concepts that we go through the low-level SDK code of what's going on when we create our app. Before I continue, I want to quickly point out that the app that we're creating is actually defined here in our intro to Algorand folder. So if we go overhead and take a look at app.py, this is an app that we've created with Beaker and PyTeal. I'm not going to be going into how it works. We'll be going over all of this uh, later on in the session or later on in this bootcamp. But the core here is that we have a application on Algorand that has a single function called increment. And this is going to increment a counter that's saved on our chain. And we're going to save that counter in state. So every time we call it, it's going to increment this value. And we're going to save who the last person to call it was, what their address was, and what their name is. So whenever they call it, they have to give us their name. So we have a counter app. And in this counter app, we generate a couple of artifacts. So when we compile an app in Beaker or whatever language you're using, we have this approval teal, clear teal, application JSON, and contract JSON. And we're going to be going over what all this means later today and also what it means for, or how this works with Beaker specifically. But I just wanted to quickly mention that our contract was written with Beaker and it generated all these artifacts for us. And it's a very simple counter application that we're gonna be incrementing. Let's assume we already know what we're doing. We've compiled our contract and now we're ready to deploy it. So what we're gonna do is first read in our source programs. So in Algorand, every application has two programs. The approval program, which is what is executed during creation whenever an end user calls it. And then a clear program, which is what is executed when an end user wants to clear all of the state associated with their account from the application. So we're just going to read these files in strings. So now this variable is basically going to contain all of this content here. And so now we have our source strings loaded. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass these strings to our AlgoD client in order to compile them. So we're going to compile our approval program by AlgoD client.compile. So we're sending that teal code to our AlgoD node. And then we're also sending our clear program to do the same. And what this is going to do, it's going to return a base64 string. And so what we need to do is convert that base64 string to binary data so we can send it to the network. So here we've read in our source files, compiled them from our node, and then converted to binary data. And that will be allow us to send it to the network. And then what we're also going to do is we're going to read in our ABI file. So here we have a contract.json. And what this does is it contains the ABI or application binary interface information about the contract. If you're a Ethereum or Solidity EVM developer, you'll be familiar with the API. It works very similar on Algorand, but if you're not, basically what this is, it basically tells us some basic information about our application. So it tells us what the name of our application is, and then all of the methods in our application, what are the names of the methods, what are the arguments to the methods, what are the types of the arguments, what is the method return, so on and so forth. So this basically tells us we've created the contract. Now, how do we interact with it? So what we've done here, so if we go back to up to our top in our imports, we imported this contract.json file as ABI. So now down here, we're setting contract variable equal to, and then we're instantiated an ABI contract from that JSON that we read in. What this will do is it'll allow us to easily more easily interact with our contract through our SDK. Go back, take a look at our contract again. We can see first we want to call our create function. 
And the question is, how do we tell the network that this is the function we want to create? We do so by what's called a method selector. So a method selector is basically a special type of string that we pass in to our application call to specify to the network what method we're calling. So all we're going to do here is we're going to call algo-sdk.getMethodByName. And this expects an array of methods. So we're going to get all of our methods from our contract. And we want to get the method that's named create. And this will return an ABI method object. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get the selector. So actually, let me, let me go ahead and log this so it's a little bit more clear. So our selector is some binary, a binary eight bytes that specifies what the contract, what method we're calling in the contract. So we're going to go ahead and log that. And then we're going to use that in our transaction. So much like our asset create transaction, whenever we want to create an application on chain, we call make application create transaction. And here, pass in our suggested params, specify who is going to be creating the account. And then we're going to pass in information specific to the account. Now, the first thing we want to do, and this is something we do every time we call or create an application, is we pass in an on complete. And an on complete basically tells the network what action do we want to take after the app call passes. So in our case, we're calling no op. This basically means don't do any special operation after the logic passes. But if we take a look here, we can see we could also do other things like we could delete the application, we could update it. We could opt in, which I'll go, which we'll talk a little bit about a bit later, or we can clear our state. We could close out, which also deletes state on the application. We don't have to go too in depth into what all these things mean right now, but the basic idea is this is telling the network all the logic in our method passes. Now, what do I do? And in our case, we don't want it to do anything special. We're just passing in our no op on complete. So now with that, we pass in our approval program. So this is the binary data for our approval TO file, and then pass in our binary data for a clear program. Then we need to specify what we call a schema. And this is basically telling the network what kind of data our application will be storing. So we go back to our app. Again, we're not gonna be going too in depth with what this all means, but if we take a look here at our state, we have one integer, so one UN64 that we're saving, and two byte slices. And so we're going to say, tell the network when we create it, we're going to be saving two byte slices. We're going to be saving one integer, and these we're going to be saving in global state. So we're saving these to the app specifically. And then we're going to be taking a look at local state as well. And this is basically state that's saved instead of to the app, it's saved to the account. But in our app, we're not using any local state, so we're defining these as zero. So up until this point, we've told the chain we want to create a new app, not going to do anything special after it's created. Then we're going to create it using these two programs, and it's going to save this kind of data. And now we can go ahead and pass in our arguments. And so on Algorand, whenever we're calling an ABI method, we're always going to call it with our first argument being the method selector. So again, the selector is telling the chain, what method do I want to call? And then we're going to go ahead and pass in our first argument, which we take a look in here, our create function takes in a name, which is a string. So here we're passing in Alice. But we need to encode it in a special way. We're not just passing a JavaScript string. We want to pass in an Algorand ABI string. So we instantiate a new ABI string type and then encode Alice. And this sort of stuff, I'll show you in just a second. We don't always have to do manually. I just wanted to show what that looks like when you do it manually. So you can really appreciate how easy it's been made by things in our SDKs and by Beaker. So what we're basically doing here is we're calling our create method, passing in Alice as the argument, and then that should create us a application. And much like our asset, we wanna get the ID that was created, 
So you go ahead and get the information from AlgoD, get the app index by calling our application index from our transaction. Let me go ahead and log it. So again, starting from up here, we are getting our source code, compiling it, converting it into binary data, forming the transaction, passing in our method selector and our first argument, and then we are gonna go ahead and send it to the network and wait for it and then get the ID. This is our transaction ID, gonna wait three and a half seconds. We can now see that our app has been created. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now we have our app, this is our app ID. It's created from our DX2 account as we'd expect. Oops. And we can see this is our app ID. We can see all of our schema information. We have two byte slices, one integer, and then we pass in our application args. These are base 64 encoded, but it's the information that we passed in. And then we could take a look. This is our approval program. So this is the code that executes when we call it. And this is the code that executes when we clear our local state. Since we don't have any local state, we're just not gonna do anything. And then we can see here, we've updated our global state to have the counter set as zero. Then we have our last caller address and caller name. And these are gonna be byte slices, but the Explorer encodes them as base64. And we'll be going over how to actually decode that and turn these into human readable values in just a minute. Again, we can go ahead, this is our page. We can now see we've had one transaction to this app, which was the creation, then all the same information that we just saw here. Again, it's important to note out that our transaction, it happened in three and a half seconds and the fee was 0 0.001 on Algorand. Even when you're working with smart contracts, fees are always 0 0.001. There is no concept of gas. It is always just a flat fee unless the network is congested, in which case bigger transactions will be more expensive. But Algorand can scale up to around 6,000 transactions per second before hitting ingestion. Uh, so you normally don't need to worry about that. So now we've created the application. This is where we're at. And now let's go ahead and call it. So as I mentioned, one of the native features of Algorand is the ability to send atomic transactions. And to make that e easier for us, we have this atomic transaction composer class. And what this also does is not only makes atomic transactions easier to send, but it makes method calls a lot easier to send. So here, what I wanna do is I wanna call this increment function to increment our global counter. So I'm going to instantiate an atomic transaction composer, most often abbreviated as ATC, and then do ATC.add method call. And this is basically saying in this atomic group, I wanna add a transaction that calls a method on chain. So we're gonna pass in our suggested parameters and our sender like we always have. And then we're gonna go ahead and this is our first unique thing that we're doing here with the Atomic Transaction Composer is specifying how we sign the transaction. So earlier, when we were just sending transactions to the network through our AlgoD client, we could just sign the transaction manually. And here, our ATC signs transactions for us. And so we need to tell the ATC how we wanna do that. And so we have to pass in a signer function and this is simply an asynchronous function that takes in unsigned transactions and then returns signed transactions. So what we're doing here is we're telling our atomic transaction composer, whenever we want to send a transaction in order to sign it, call this signer method. And the signer method takes the unsigned transactions. And here we're gonna sign it with our account. And then we're specifying the app ID. So this is the ID on chain that we wanna call the method on, specifying our method. So I'll go SDK, get method by name and using our ABI contract dot methods. And this time we're calling increment. And then we're gonna specify our argument, which is simply the name of the person calling the contract as Bob. Now earlier we had to do this manual encoding and pass in our selector. But here, we don't need to pass in our selector because that's done here. And we don't need to manually encode it because the Atomic Transaction Composer will know 
to convert a string, a JavaScript string into an Algorand ABI string. And so now in order to send this transaction, we simply call ATC execute, and this will use AlgoD client to send the transaction to the network and wait for it to get confirmed. So if I go ahead and do that, wait three and a half seconds, we see that we have called the application. So the same application ID as before, we now have two transactions and we can see we've updated our counter to now be one. And we've also updated our caller name and caller address. And now this is pretty easy to tell, counter is one, but our last counter name is bytes and it's encoded as base 64. We know because we just called it that this should be Bob, but the question is how do we actually decode that in our SDK? So what we can do here is get the application state so if we call algoD client, get application by ID, pass in our app index, and then based on that response, get the parameters of our global state, and then output our global state, what we'll see here is we have three global state key value pairs. We have this key here, which has a uint of one, this key, which has this byte string, and then this key, which has this byte string. So to actually decode it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate over each of these key value pairs. And we're gonna say our key is gonna be a buffer from this base 64 value. So for every key we iterate over, we're basically converting this key into a string. So going from base 64 to a buffer to a string. And then we're doing the same thing with our bytes value. So here we're taking this bytes value and converting it into a just binary data. We're not converting it to a string right away. And I'll talk about it why in just a second. So now here we want to go over all of our keys. When our key is equal to counter, we want to log the the uint value. So for here in our counter, we want to just log this one. For our last call address, we want to call algo SDK dot encode address and encode our binary bytes. And this is why we didn't convert the value to a string right away, because we know one of our values is a string, which will be our name, but our other value is an address, which has the specific encoding. So we call algo SDK dot encode address and then pass in our binary bytes. And then we're going to go ahead and get our last caller name. And we're going to go last caller name is equal to binary bytes dot two string. So we go ahead and run that. We can now see our counter is one. So we've decoded this to be, this is counter, our value is one. Then we've decoded the last caller address, which is this key and decoded this value to an address. You see that our DX2 address is there. And then in our last caller name, we've decoded this key to be the last caller name and this value to be Bob. And so that's how we decode a value. So that concludes the introduction to Algorand through the Algo SDK. Again, to summarize what we've done here, we've started with a brand new account. We went to the net testnet dispenser, funded that account, sent our first transaction. We minted an asset. We opted a new account into that asset. We funded that new account. We sent we minted that asset into the circulating supply, and then we've created an account, created an application, and interact with that application through our SDK. And this is going to be just the high-level overview. Again, we're going to be going over smart contract details in depth in our other three sessions. The goal here is just introduce you to the core algorithm concepts and how our SDK works.